This is an elite group we have this afternoon. In the crypt of St. Paul's Cathedral in London, a number of notable Englishmen lie buried, one of whom is Christopher Wren. The Latin inscription on his tomb translates roughly as, If you wish to see his accomplishments, look around you. Although we are certainly not in a crypt, I have something of the same feeling about the accumulated experiences of our panelists today. With a combined total of more than 125 years in teaching and professional leadership, our speakers this afternoon are certainly in an unrivaled position to address our theme of legacy, change, and perpetuity. In the interest of allowing our speakers more time, I will only highlight their experiences. Betsy Bach, as most of you know, is our beloved current president who makes everyone feel a part of the group and the organization and very valued. Professor Bach's current academic home is the University of Montana at Missoula. Our second panelist is Joan Connors of Randolph-Macon College in Ashland, Virginia, a Ph.D. from the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. She is currently an associate professor at Randolph-Macon and was co-director of the HOPE Conference in 2007. Interestingly, all of us today have PhDs from different institutions, and I think that's always fun. Third among our presenters is Sonia Foss, whose PhD is from Northwestern University. Currently, she is professor at the University of Colorado at Denver and is engaged, as most of you know, in extensive work in helping graduate students finish their dissertations. If it had not been for Dr. Foss, one of my colleagues probably still would be fumbling with her dissertation, but as it is, she has finished and we were able to have a party. (laughs) The November Spectra does include her role as co-editor of the Encyclopedia of Communication. Deanna Selnow, our fourth speaker, received her doctorate from the University of North Dakota and is currently a professor at the University of Kentucky. An award-winning forensicator, near and dear to our hearts here, as an undergraduate, she is the past president of the Central States Communication Association. Professor Selnow is included in our most recent spectra for her rhetorical power of popular culture, considering mediated text. Fifth among our panelists is Professor Ted Sheckles, a longtime friend of mine from Randolph-Macon College. The recipient of a doctorate from Penn State University, he has been a debate coach since 1980 and is an active teacher and publishing scholar. He serves as co-director of the HOPE Conference and is co-director of the NCA Institute of Faculty Development. The last presenter today is Professor Kathy Turner, whose Ph.D. is from Purdue, currently a professor at Davidson College in North Carolina. She's a past recipient of the NCA's Eckroyd Award for Outstanding Teaching in Higher Education, and currently is chair of the Communication Center's section of NCA. She was also a scholar in residence at the HOPE Conference, NCA's Summer Institute for Faculty Development, and I can tell you that she makes being on the nominating committee a great deal more interesting. (laughs) This panel, then, we can tell, will give us great insight of legacy, change, and perpetuity. Welcome. Hi. I was asked to be on this panel in my role as president of the National Communication Association and was delighted to be asked, so thank you. NCA, I think, has always been a very strong supporter of the undergraduate college and university section, in part because I think it's the heart of the association. And I say that in part because I 
cut my academic teeth in the undergraduate college and university section being a, a graduate of, of Hope College and having as my mentor Joe McDonald's, who started uh, with Roger Smitter, the NCA Institute for, what's it, for faculty development. That's what it's, is that, oh. Is that always been the name? I thought. No. Uh, okay. Good. But it has recently. But it has recently. All right. I, I'm not as. I was taken for a loop there for a minute. In any event, you know, even if the association w- would go under in the next decade or in the next uh, millennium, whatever, I still think the undergraduate college and university section would be at the core because that is the place where all of our undergraduates, aside from the community college section, where all of our undergraduates are exposed to and introduced to the notion of communication. And so without this particular section and group, we will no longer exist. We will no longer have students who will go on to become professors and so on. So this is... I guess the dinosaur, because it will never die. You know, I guess dinosaurs do die. But no, I mean, you know, it's it'll always be there. The cockroach. The cockroach, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a good thing. <laughs> if we look to the future, one thing I want... Uh, and that I hope really at least five years out for this section will be something um, that I hope we've introduced this year but will only become refined and become of use and valuable to faculty really, and students in the, the undergraduate college and university section. And these are some guidelines for program review that we've just revised and developed this year. And these guidelines are guidelines that I hope the section will be able to use to assess and compare communication study at all of our undergraduate and university sections across the board. Uh, As finances become tighter as it becomes more difficult to hire and recruit students to schools in these tough financial times, being able to have assessment guidelines I think is going to be very, very useful. And so we are getting some people to introduce these this year by taking them and actually bringing them to their departments for review and assessment. And in the next five years, it's my hope that we will have refined and defined them so they are crisp. I mean, nothing is great the first time you uh, introduce it. And so if anybody's interested in having a test run of these, let me know. We also hope in five years that we will have a much bigger database for department chairs and people at senior college and university sections to use so they can compare their particular units with like units in the discipline. And I don't know if any of you received um, a plea or a request to fill out a survey on this data Um, but please do, because we would love to hear what you have to say. Both of these will be posted to the NCA website uh, by the first of the year, and so we encourage you to take a look at them and use them. That said, I mean, I I just see this section as, well, truly the cockroach. (laughs) You you know, you, you can't go away, you can't die, because the rest of the association depends on you so much. So please continue to be that cockroach (laughs) and continue to improve um, by using guidelines to assess, help us develop a database so we can continue to serve you all as we progress the next five years and beyond. Thank you. Hello. 
The Council of Graduate Schools reports that only 13% of students who begin PhD, excuse me, 33% of students who begin PhD uh, programs in the humanities and the social sciences actually finish. So my part in this program is to address our mentoring of graduate students so that they complete their dissertations and finish their degrees. Let me give you a very quick explanation of why I think I'm qualified to do this. Uh, I've offered something called Scholars Retreats for many years where people come to work on theses, dissertations, and writing projects in a very focused um, environment. I've co-authored a book called Destination Dissertation mm -hmm. uh, where we talk about writing theses and dissertations. Uh, and I've also shared my strategies with uh, students at uh, and faculty members, advisors at various universities across the uh, country. So I'm pretty familiar with the kinds of things that really keep students from finishing. So we're supposed to talk here about both legacy and the future in this program. And I think obviously the legacy, from my perspective with this topic, uh, in terms of dissertations, is very clear. Uh, the outstanding communication professors and scholars in our field who did complete their dissertations uh, that allowed them to enter the field as professionals. Uh, in terms of the future, I thought I would share a few ideas that I found most helpful in getting students uh, to finish their dissertations. Uh, and I, I think these are things that we almost all do with our students, but maybe focusing even more on these kinds of things uh, will get that completion rate up a little bit higher. So first, uh, I want to talk about how we talk about dissertations. And as we all know, how we talk about something affects our experience of it. And I think that metaphors of struggle that most people use to talk about their dissertations, both students and advisors, uh, are part of the reason that students fail to finish. Metaphors like running a marathon or getting audited by the IRS or <laughs> learning a Martian language. These kinds of metaphors simply say, make the process seem so difficult and so painful that you can't accomplish it. So I like to look at writing the dissertation instead as taking a trip. So writing a dissertation will be a vacation away from normal routine for a little while. It will be a fixed amount of time. You will return from that trip. You will get that dissertation done. And it's going to be exciting and stimulating. And you're got, you've got the confidence that even though you'll encounter some obstacles, you will be able to figure out how to get around them. Second, I think dissertations get done if the processes involved are made concrete and manageable. Whenever possible, I think students should divide big processes into small, tiny ones to make small, chunkable, discrete steps out of something that has to be done. So instead of thinking, I have to write my literature review, these steps would change the student's thinking to, okay, today I have to code these eight books for my literature review. And so you know exactly where you are, you know exactly when you're done with that step. A third bit of advice I would have for students in the future is that I think students often write too soon. Many people encourage students to start writing right away. I think students should start working on their dissertations right away, but I don't think they should start writing. They're less likely to get stuck, and they're more able to move quickly through the process when they have a sense of the whole picture before they begin any writing. So I really recommend that students take several hours uh, at the very beginning of the dissertation process to have a conceptual conversation, ideally with the advisor, but it doesn't have to be, and in this conversation, the student figures out the research question, the data, the methods of data collection and analysis, the significance of the dissertation, and the chapters. And so then you know you've got all the key pieces. You can assess whether they align or not, fix them if they don't, um, and then the student can start writing. Fourth, I think dissertations take six and a half months to write. My co-author and I have worked out a timetable in our book uh, where there are 29 steps that typically go into a dissertation, we figured out that they should take 1,078 uh, 1, hours to complete. So if students are working 40 hours a week on the dissertation, that translates into seven, 27 weeks or six and a half months. Now, a lot of students do their six and a half uh, months in four or five years, but we suggest that you can do your six and a half months in six and a half months. Uh, and finally, I've learned about all sorts of creative ways that students 
uh, think of to avoid writing their dissertations. And these often take the form of what I call incomplete scholar roles. Being a scholar involves two kinds of work, coming up with ideas and writing those ideas down so that they can be published and shared with other people and assessed and evaluated. Well, what many students do to respond to the exigency of writing a dissertation is that they enact an incomplete scholar role. So they enact the first part of the scholar, they come up with ideas, but they don't complete the role by writing those ideas down. And instead of enacting the scholar role, they often assume a role that makes them into something other than a scholar. And I've identified eight incomplete scholar roles that are very common among students. Uh, let me just mention one of them. Uh, and it's, it's a very common one. It's the incomplete scholar role of the housekeeper. And in this role, students try to make their environment perfect before they write. Uh, and they think, if I can just get this writing environment perfect, then I'll be able to write easily. And so they always are working on figuring out ways to make their environment better, whether that's cleaning out the kitchen cupboards or straightening the fringe on the carpet in their office or uh, getting the inbox cleared out uh, in email, for example. So we've identified uh, several other incomplete scholar roles, including the patient, uh, the uh, model employee, the proxy critic, the executor, the good student. But the important thing, of course, is for students not to figure out what role they're assuming, but how to get out of that incomplete scholar role. And the primary antidote to any of those incomplete scholar roles is writing regularly. Because what those incomplete scholar roles have in common is that they allow students to do things other than to write. And so what you want to do then to become a complete scholar is to make writing a regular recurrent activity. And I have a number of strategies that I teach students to make sure that they engage in regular writing, uh, things that are probably familiar to all of you. 40-minute uh, uh, writing cycles where you write for 40 minutes, take, take a break for 20, write for 40 minutes, take a, a break for 20. Keeping track of how much you write every day and sharing those results with someone at the, at the end of every week. Uh, asking a friend to call you at the beginning of your writing time. Not to chit-chat, but just to say, are you sitting down now and are you ready to write? So these are just a few of the things that I've learned as I've been helping students uh, make progress on finishing their dissertations so that they can join us as scholars and professors in the communication discipline. Uh, these are things I've found help move students forward and get them finished. Uh, in other words, they really do make writing the dissertation a trip. I'm Deanna Selnow, and I'm at the University of Kentucky, and I actually serve there as the director of the Undergraduate Studies, Pro Studies Program in Communication with about 450 majors. I believe in undergraduate education. It's my passion. When I decided to go on to get a PhD, it was because I wanted to teach college, and what that meant to me was teaching college undergraduates. So it's a privilege and an honor to be here to talk a little bit about where I think our legacy has come from, and I think where we're heading in the future to be in front of, in front of where we need to be. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned that I did forensics because um, that is what got me into this discipline. It was uh, doing forensics, uh, competing uh, with other undergraduate students across my region and, and eventually the country. Uh, forensics is also where the speech discipline started, right? We grew out of English in 1914 and became teachers of speech. And so there is definitely that. That's the legacy, if I was going to say. It would be public speaking and it would be communication skills training is where we um, began. And then we broadened ourselves because we started to borrow from, or as one of my colleagues says, we abducted some of the ideas from sociology and psychology, but found the talk in them. And so we started to do things in interpersonal communication, organizational communication, media, health, et cetera. And so we really are a very broad uh, field of communication that embraces the rhetorical tradition that forensics comes from and the speaking skills tradition and also uh, small group interpersonal, these sorts of uh, social science-based forms. So we have a tall order in terms of what we do. Um, 
I'm going to just speak a little bit about where I think we're at and where we need to go. And I think the most important thing, if I was going to say about communication teaching, where we are at and where we need to go, is we are definitely now at a place that's very exciting to me in terms of we are focused on student learning. We are focused on outcomes-based programs and outcomes-based courses and curriculum. In other words, assessment is driving who we are. And 25 years ago, when assessment started to come out as a word, it, it had a it had a really negative connotation, and it felt like we were being judged from above to see whether or not we were doing what we were supposed to be doing. We now understand that assessment is not that at all. Um, it's not a four-letter word. Asse- <laughs> Double entendre. Okay. <laughs> Uh, it's not. Uh, assessment is all about focusing on student learning. What do we expect of our students by the end of this course? What do we expect our students should be able to do by the end of our program at their undergraduate degree? And then figuring out ways to assess whether or not what we're doing with our students is, is helping, uh, helping them achieve that goal or if there are ways that we can improve that. So it's about improving student learning. And I think that the next five years we're going to see even more of that. And if we can embrace that and help our colleagues understand that it isn't a negative thing, but it's a thing about how to reach the students that we are teaching today because we do it's not it isn't just the same as it was and how we can best meet their needs in terms of that they're coming out of our programs with with what we want and expect them to have i keep thinking about those uh uh, surveys of uh, college employers and univer- uh, of our undergraduates and teamwork skills mm-hmm. um, uh, interpersonal skills uh, oral communication skills writing skills all the things that we teach our undergraduates are what they're saying they want more of and so we really are important not just to our communication majors but across our campuses because of what we can offer and provide to our students so I think that's where we're going to see ourselves even more in the future um, and I think that I want to talk a little bit about programmatic innovation in that regard because one thing that's happening right now, and I wonder if anyone, anyone else out here, are any of you in the throes of revising your general education curricula at your institutions? Yeah, it's, it's really, we've been doing the same thing since about the early 1990s and all of our institutions are look, re-looking at our general education curriculum. And I think that we want to be in the forefront of that because one of the things that's happening is trying to figure out how to deliver what we deliver across our campuses in a way that's efficient effective and economically feasible right and that's very difficult and some of the things that I think are going to happen and that we can probably get in front of because they're going to happen whether we are going to be at the helm or not um, one is vertical integration of those skills Um, and these skills are now um, not just public speaking right it's interpersonal teamwork and public speaking but it's also in a variety of formats written formats digital formats visual formats, and how we can get in front of that. One way that we can probably get in front of that, and I think we'll need to, is vertical integration, which means linking ourselves with other disciplines so that students see the relevance of what it is they're learning with relation to their own degree field that that they're seeking degrees in. Um, Certainly there's also the role of communication across the curriculum centers is going to become even uh, bigger as we move forward. Speech labs is going to be bigger as we move forward. Um, online instruction and delivery of our courses in a way that um, is pedagogically sound is going to be really important. Um, uh, and the and the different kinds of pedagogies, the different strategies that we can employ in, in working with our students. Our students, when I went to college back with the dinosaurs and the cockroaches, <clears throat> uh, we didn't, I didn't have a job outside of the school. I, I didn't even have work study but I paid $13 a credit hour for my school. And nowadays, the students are working full-time. They're working several different jobs. They're also, um, so many of them have families already. And so it's a different kind of a student population. And we need to think about how we can um, address the, stu- the students who are very much multitasking. You know there's that saying out there that they say that students' attention spans have gotten so small, like some people, some of the research will say it's like seven seconds before they... It's not that their attention spans are shorter... It's that they multitask and prioritize what's important. And so unless we can make what we're, if we can entice them to see the relevance of what it is they're learning from us, they're going to prioritize us out of the picture, 
right? And so I think that that's going to be crucial in terms of meeting the needs of students in uh, five years out. Um, and we know we're relevant, but we need to make sure that they see it. So I think we were going to be thinking about experiential education opportunities, service learning opportunities, ways to help them see that why what they're doing matters to the community beyond the institution so that they see that relevance and utility of what they're doing. I think that's in terms of programmatic shifts for our undergraduates. Um, particularly, I think we're doing a good job with that with our majors, but particularly with the, in our servicing of the campus populations. I see that as where we'll be heading in five years out. The last thing that I want to mention is uh, the, a little bit about tra training and mentoring. I think that um, I think that in five years we're going to do a better job across our campuses uh, in terms of what we can offer in terms of workshops and training and developing and mentoring of other instructors and graduate students, not just in our old field. I think we'll be branching out in that regard and mentoring of new teachers, not within our own departments, which we do a good job of, but across institutions and across campuses. We have a lot to offer, and I think that that's going to start to get tapped more and more, and I'm excited about it. Thank you. Thirty-one years ago this fall, I got my first job as a professor, lowly assistant professor, at Denison University in the village of Granville, Ohio. One of my teaching responsibilities was mass communication law. Now, I'd never taken a course in mass communication law. I'd never taught a course in mass communication law. My advisor said, what you do is get a good book for the students and a better book for yourself and read like crazy. It worked. And indeed, I have followed that advice for any number of classes, and I've also passed that advice along to others. I was asked today to speak about mentoring younger faculty. For me, the joy of mentoring is being able to pay forward the kind of advice that I've received from my advisor and from any number of colleagues, older, peers, and younger, not just when I was getting started, but also as I continue and change in directions and jobs. I don't see mentor as guru or as teacher, but as a translator of sorts, someone who helps others understand the institutional values of research, teaching, and service, institutional not only in terms of where you are employed, but also the culture here. Not only the de jure, but also the de facto values and the ways that those might fit with the individual's personal values. As the gray cells migrate from my brain to my hair, I realize that there are indeed benefits to age and experience because it gives me a perspective on a variety of experiences from negotiating the tenure process to what you do when you come in and you're facing a class for which you don't exactly feel fully prepared. Because I've often been there and done that whether or not I got the t-shirt. It's especially important, I think, for those of us at undergraduate colleges and universities to help our younger colleagues understand the differences between the expectations of the Research One graduate programs from which we were hatched, if you will, and those of small undergraduate programs, because it seems to me that graduate schools emphasize specialization. They really want to recreate themselves by sending graduate students to similar kinds of institutions. And small undergraduate programs aren't similar institutions. You have to be a generalist, not a specialist. And you have to be committed to teaching as well as continuing scholarship. You have to see the value of making connections. You have to be able to cherish breadth as a different kind of depth. So you have to be a Jack or Jill of all trades and know the benefits of doing that. Making that shift in perspectives, I think, can be nerve-wracking confidence shattering and downright scary. That shift is not aided by the fact that, and this is just between us, right, uh, the tenure process at most institutions is not exactly welcoming. 
In fact, I feel that at some institutions it is intentionally designed to make you feel like a therm. Or a cockroach. Or a dinosaur. The question is continually, well, yeah, you've done all that, but what have you done for us lately? And so mentors can help junior faculty in understanding that it's not just them. It is the whole process. They feel like a verm because that's the design of the process. And I think Deanna's point about not only helping our younger faculty in communication, but helping our younger faculty across the institution is a really good one. But mentoring goes beyond this tenure process. It includes helping a graduate student understand and fulfill her call to teach. It includes reassuring a young colleague who is in the throes of finishing his dissertation, even as he tackles a new job. It includes helping an adjunct faculty member find additional teaching responsibilities in a shrinking job market. It includes talking with a colleague about balancing professional and personal concerns. It includes assuring a phenomenal young scholar who saw herself as a round peg in a square hole, that she was a magnificent round peg, and that we would look for round holes together. What's more... I would argue that mentoring also includes the wonderful opportunity to serve as a seminar leader and scholar-in-residence at the HOPE Conference, where I get to meet absolutely magnificent people, including Rob sitting back there grinning at me. And it includes serving as an external reviewer, not only for individual promotion and tenure documents, but also for departments. I really enjoy going out and looking at what various programs are doing, helping the faculty understand just how much they're doing right, which I sometimes find is the biggest challenge, and also finding ways to help them address what they'd like to be better. In addition, as part of those external reviews, it's also helping the administration understand just what wonderful work those programs are doing. So overall, I see my goal as a mentor being to reduce the stress, to bolster confidence, and to help people find a measure of joy. Now, I don't want you to get the notion that my mentoring is altruistic, that I'm some kind of academic lady bountiful who hands out these lovely morsels of wisdom to the downtrodden. Let's get this straight. Mentoring is one of the most selfish activities in which I engage. I gain new perspectives on research, teaching, and service. I gain a new understanding of how to deal with the students, especially because those faculty are closer to their age than I am, and that's including all the time. I get help in understanding new theories, new methodologies, new pedagogies, and especially important for a techno-dinosaur, those new technologies, which just baffle me. I get a sense of humility at how our colleagues face incredible pressures and they do so with such grace. And if you employ the Johari window, I get a lot of insight into my blind area. In short, mentoring helps keep me feeling young, even as it reminds me that I am not. Thank you. Joan and I are gonna talk about an enterprise that is often associated with the undergraduate college and university section. And that's the conference that is referred to by people who've been there as the HOPE Conference. And I'll talk about the name change in a a bit. Let me take you back through the history of the HOPE Conference. The 2011 rendition will be the Institute's 25th anniversary. So let me go back 25 or so years. The need to identify a core curriculum for smaller undergraduate institutions, because the curricula were all over the place, that need led Joe McDaniels at Hope College and Roger Smitter at North Central College to stage the Essentials Conference at Hope College. That was the beginning. They came up with a curriculum that consisted of a list of courses. Then they decided that the faculty at these kinds of schools needed assistance to teach this particular curriculum. And they staged a series of summer institutes 
uh, which had as their goal helping undergraduate faculty teach these essentials, teach these essential courses. Outstanding members of the discipline came and helped these faculty. Some of the names down through the years, uh, this is an incomplete list, Anita Evangelisti, Larry, Fly, Larry Fry, Carol Blair, Raymond McCaro, Julia Wood, Ken Cisna, Marty Methurst, Brent Burleson, and I have a lot of dots here, you know, all the rest of the names, and Kathy Turner and Betsy Bach, to mention two people at the podium. These outstanding members of the discipline came, taught, mentored, in some cases ended up working collaboratively with the people who were there at the conference and became role models and colleagues. Along the way, other needs were identified, but during the years at Hope, the emphasis was always on teaching undergraduates. And it became undergraduates at a range of institutions, not just the smaller undergraduate schools where it began. The need for NCA support and NCA money led Joe and Roger to ask the undergraduate college and university section for its endorsement. And this is the beginning of NCA's involvement in this particular enterprise. And at that point, you know, the NCA uh, name began appearing in, uh, on the program. Uh, before the end of Hope at Hope, the Hope Conference at Hope College, another Essentials Conference was held. This one designed a very different curriculum. It wasn't courses. It was competencies. And this reflected the, the fact that not only were there a, a greater number of possible shapes that an undergraduate curriculum could take, but also that the discipline had grown, had acquired more breadth than it had when the HOPE conference first took place. Upon Joe McDaniel's retirement, Alan Lerstrom and Joe Daly took the institute to Luther College for a five-year stint. And, and there we started referring to it as HOPE at Luther, but in small print, there was always NCA Institute for Faculty Development. The conference continued to gradually evolve. Uh, keynotes from, for all the seminar leaders were added. More social programming was added. You know, things like pizza night and canoeing and tubing on the upper Iowa River. All those exciting times were added. Uh, then Joan and I brought the Institute to Randolph-Macon College for another five-year stint. And in response to a strategic plan for the Institute that we, we authored, NCA supported, uh, NCA's support for the Institute increased 333%. And that has really made the Institute much more affordable. And at that point, it became the NCA Institute for Faculty <laughs> Development. And people talk about, you know, you know Hope at Randolph-Macon, you know, those who've uh, been there, but it's the NCA Institute for Faculty Development. After our last Hope in 2011, the Institute returns for a five-year stint to Hope College. So in five years out, that's where we'll be will be in Holland, Michigan. But perhaps more important, in 2010, 2011, one and a half, three years out, we will be celebrating 25 years of hope. Why do we celebrate? Well, Joan, in focusing on recent history uh, and what's been going on, will suggest some of the reasons why we celebrate. Thank you. Um, I want to talk a bit about maybe some of the outcomes that we've seen in recent past of hosting this conference at Randolph-Macon, uh, talk about some of the innovations that we have noticed as well in these past few years and maybe, again, kind of where we might see this going. Um, I, in running the conference in these past few years, I've done evaluations at the end of the conference and the kinds of things people expect to come from this conference in terms of how it will uh, affect them 
first and foremost is with their teaching, um, that they found new life to breathe into their courses, uh, that they now feel more confident teaching the, the class that's been assigned to them that they've never studied in their lives, but they have some grasp of that. They've also made this connection with faculty as seminar leaders who are not just scholars, but I consider them in many cases rock stars in the area. And you've had a chance to pick their brain for five days. You've had breakfast with them. You've had drinks with them. You can now call on them when you need other ideas and resources and advice and suggestions. Um, but the kinds of things I've seen people respond to are, you know, I'm overhauling this class, I'm starting from scratch, or I'm going to revise this, or I'm going to do more active learning perhaps as part of these courses. New research ideas that have come from the week um, have certainly been the case. Um, a rejuvenation of one's teaching and one's research and oneself as well tends to be kind of the comments that we get at the end of this. And I'm trying to come up with some other insect um, analogies because I don't really want the, con the, uh, the cockroach to follow me through the day. So maybe we'd almost envision the week of transformation, the caterpillar to the butterfly at the end of the week maybe is how I'd like to see this. We do have a lot of mosquitoes in Virginia, I should mention. That was my other thought, but we'll, we'll celebrate the butterfly instead. Um, the kinds of outcomes that I've heard and, and witnessed as well, kind of besides this feedback, is a couple of really substantial things. It isn't just so much teaching based in the overhaul of a course or how my course has improved. Um, a couple examples I can share with you just from the past few years that we've had. Um, we've had discussions um, come from seminars and research that's come from seminars that has led to NCA panels on research from our faculty colleagues. Uh, the example most recently of that was Carol Blair had held a seminar on the rhetoric of place and memorials in Washington, D.C. that was accompanied with a field trip to Washington, D.C. that led to an NCA panel on kind of a follow-up the year after of people in her seminar and the research that they had conducted and where they went from that. Uh, we had a group communication seminar sponsored or run by Isa Engelberg, and I was a uh privilege to be part of that group, not being a group communication professor uh, whatsoever. Uh, but as part of that week of discussion and deliberation of group communication, we came up with this group dialectics. It then became the guiding principle for her next edition of her group communication textbook. So that was exciting to see this this project of this week manifests itself in her book, and of course I'll had some kind of acknowledgement in that as well. Uh, that was actually a Luther conference here, um, Hope at Luther. Uh, because of discussions through our, one of our innovations is our scholar in residence, but one of the outcomes of that was a, because of discussions that had taken place during our scholar in residence program, uh, Kathy Turner hosted a, a Southern States panel discussion on Janice Hocker Rushing's erotic mentoring just last year, that had, would have not, I mean, I would hope that would have happened, but that happened because those discussions originated at this conference. So I think we see those kinds of opportunities really to be, being taken advantage of. And we, uh, Ted and I have just come from a meeting to meet with a couple of the seminar leaders for this year, and we talk about kind of the organic nature. We, we can have seminars planned and have readings prepared and know what people are going to do, and then things just kind of take over during the week. And the synergy that occurs there can really just be incredibly exciting, but it's something we can't predict. Um, the kind of innovations, the kinds of things that Ted and I have been um, pursuing in the past few years with this, uh, the first year we hosted this conference because of our proximity to Washington, D.C., we did take a day of the conference, uh, didn't do our regular seminars, and had people going to Washington, D.C. for various uh, visits. The uh, monuments um, and rhetoric of place. We also had a group on um, political communication going to meet with C-SPAN. They met with some um, political heads um, at the NCA headquarters. We had that um, some discussions hosted there. We then added the Scholar in Residence program where we bring back uh, some of our regular and favorite seminar leaders to come back in a very different role. Um, they're commenting on our colleagues' work in progress for research. They're doing kind of, we call it office hours in terms of some one-on-one -on -one discussions with them. They're leading discussions about the communication curriculum, um, maybe about assessment issues, about leadership issues, and kind of steering the entire group in a different direction. Um, the conference historically has had some traditional kinds of topics it focuses on in terms of interpersonal and rhetoric and mass communication, and we've been able to expand that into some other areas, inviting conversations for the week on organizational communication, uh, nonverbal communication, teaching with film. Um, we're doing some, a seminar this coming year on media and diversity. So we're really branching out, certainly things that we see um, when we look at NCA panels, but we're, we're trying to focus more of that week on those issues as well. 
Um, if we look five years out, I think we would hope that a lot of kind of the character of the week and the experience of the week that people have will be very much the same. Um, I don't expect it to change much in its uh, primary goals and mission, but it will certainly operate differently because, as Ted alluded to, it will be, uh, I guess then we'll call it hope at hope. <laughs> <laughs> when it came hope to Randolph-Macon, pardon me? Hope squared. Yes, hope squares. Hope, hope springs again. Um, when it came to Randolph-Macon, people said, well, is it now going to be hope at Luther at Randolph-Macon? Kind of how are we alluding to this? We'll be hope at hope. Um, as we've said, we'll be celebrating our 25th anniversary of this conference, of this uh, summer conference in 2011. Um, we hope to maybe do some celebration of that at NCA next year. Uh, but it will be in a new place. It's going to be back in its roots at Hope College um, starting in, in 2012. Um, and the directors of the program at that time will kind of help shape the next five years of that vision in terms of their hosting of that conference. So um, my role here is not just to kind of do some of this review, but also to now move to my shameless plug to uh, encourage you to uh, take advantage of our experience of this conference if you haven't already, and we do have brochures on the 2011, uh, the 2010 conference, I should mention, uh, that we'd be happy to uh, share with you, and hopefully we'll see you there sometime. Thanks. Our media people have asked me to end the session and then have the questions and comments because of the length of the tape that we're using. So I will do that. Whether it is teaching, training, mentoring, or programmatic innovation, I think you can see that everything is really good. Uh, We have a strong legacy. We are in the process of change and the undergraduate college and university section is a viable section. And may I put in a plug, our meeting is this afternoon at 3.30 in the Kimball Room in the Palmer, and we would love to have everybody there, because if you come, then we'll tell you where the cocktail hour is. (laughs) And finally, cockroaches really are incredible. My all-time favorite informative speech was given last year, and I learned so much about cockroaches. I was so glad we used that today. (laughs) May we now uh, make comments and ask questions of the panelists? We have them all together at one time. Yes, please. From those of you who've been to the developmental conference, I'm never going to get over saying hope. That's okay. Okay, that's all right. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Comments from those of you? Yes? No? Okay. Yes? Yeah, it's been a great experience. When I talk about mentoring not being altruistic, I learn so much about how to stay upright in a canoe. (laughs) 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 Panelist? Well, thank you all very much for coming. We really appreciate it.